Let's have a look at cable resistance and expected values. One of the most useful and frequent tests you will carry out is a resistance test or a continuity test. And this is used in your initial verification, it's used when you're testing the installation, and it's used when you're fault finding the installation. These resistance tests have many different terms, but it's all based on the same principle. We're testing the continuity of your protective conductors and your main bonding conductors, your ring final continuity, your insulation resistance, your polarity, your ZE, your ZS, your earth fault and loop impedance. And we can make sure the installation is safe. We can check for extraneous conductive parts. And we have certain values that we can work to. But we can confirm that everything works as it should and electrical devices are connected correctly. But the important thing is to know what cable resistance to expect. Otherwise, you won't be able to interpret your test results. So it's really simple to work out the resistance of our cable. We just need to know how long the cable is. We need to know what size the cable is in millimeters squared and what the resistance per meter of the cable is. Resistance is a measure of the opposition to current flow in a cable and it is measured in ohms. We're only going to deal with copper conductors here. It's such a good conductor that the values we're talking about, the numbers we're talking about, are very, very low. In this example here, we've got one meter of 2.5 millimeter squared conductor, and that would have a resistance of 0 0.00741 ohms. That's quite a long number to write down. So we get rid of the noughts, we convert it into milliohms to make it easier to read. So we times that number by 1,000 and we get 7.41 milliohms. So one meter of 2.5 millimeter squared copper conductor has a resistance of 7.41 milliohms per meter. If you want to convert it back, we divide it by 1,000. So if we know what the resistance is per meter of copper conductor, we can work out what the resistance should be for longer runs. Here we can see the 2.5 millimeter squared conductor is 7.41 milliohms. There's publications that give this value for all the different cable sizes. Here I've just got from 1 millimeter squared to 25 millimeter squared, which are common cable sizes we use. So we can work out what the resistance should be for a given length, and it's some simple math. So the resistance will be the milliohms per meter times the length in meters divided by a thousand. Remember we divide by a thousand to get it back into ohms for milliohms. So if we've got a 2.5 millimeter conductor at 25 meters, that's 7.41 times 25 divided by a thousand. And that will give us a resistance of 0 0.185 ohms. So 25 meters of 2.5 millimeter squared copper conductor has a resistance of 0 0.185 ohms. And here we have another example, this time it's 10 millimeter squared conductor. Let's have a look. 10 millimeter squared conductor has a value of 1.83 milliohms per meter. So we do the same sum, 1.83 times 40, the length, divided by 1000 to get it back into ohms. And the resistance of this conductor is 0 0.073 ohms. So 40 meters of 10 millimeter squared copper conductor has a resistance of 0 0.073 ohms. Now where would it be useful to know that? It would be useful when you're testing one conductor, such as your main protective bonding conductors, which is generally done with the long lead method, and there's no regs on any numbers you should be getting, but there is guidance that it should be below 0 0.05 of an ohm. Nobody's quite sure where that number comes from, to be honest. But that's the guidance that we're being given. Remember in the previous example, we got 0 0.073 ohms, and that was for 40 meters of 10 mil conductor. So if it needs to be less than 0 0.05, we know that 40 meters is going to be too long. For our main bonding conductors, we might have to consider going to a larger size. We'll do this later, but you can actually transpose the formula and work out from 0 0.05 ohms how many meters that is. I'll tell you it's 27.32 metres, but we'll do that in a bit. 
So that's how to work out the resistance for one conductor. But what if you want to work out the resistance to two conductors? Which you might want to do when you're doing your volt drop calculations. Are you doing your R1 plus R2s? Let's have a look at that. So the R1 plus R2 test will be between line and CPC. So it's used for confirming continuity of the CPC. In polarity tests, your earth fault loop impedance. And when you're confirming volt drop, you would test between R1 and Rn. That is between your line and your neutral conductors. Remember we've got a milli ohms per meter reading for each conductor size. Now sometimes the conductors in the cable aren't the same size. If you're using singles, you generally use the same size conductors. And in flex and SWA, the conductors usually have the same cross-sectional area. But in twinning earth, the CPC has a smaller cross-sectional area than the live conductors, the line and the neutral. When we're working out the resistance of conductors in twin and earth cable, we have to be careful. The line and neutral will have the same size cross-sectional area, but the CPC will be slightly smaller, and there is a ratio on the table here, you can see it. Generally, one millimeter square cable has a one millimeter CPC, 1.5 has a one mil, 2.5 has a 1.5, 4 mil has a 1.5 millimeter squared CPC, 6 is a 2.5, 10 has a 4 millimeter CPC, and 16 has a 6 millimeter CPC. Sometimes it's 10. And as you can see, there's a ratio there the cross sectional area of the line conductor compared to the CPC. We'll take the example of 2.5 millimeter squared cable. So if you've got 2.5 millimeter squared twin in Earth, the live conductors will be 2.5, the CPC will be 1.5. So the ratio, the difference between the CPC and the line conductors is 1.67. And we can verify that the resistance region we're getting correlate to the length of cable. So as you can see here, if we had 25 metres of 2.5 twin and earth cable, the line and the neutral would give you a value of 0.18 ohms end to end. The CPC will give you a reading of 0 0.3 of an ohm, end to end. So I see you're doing your continuity of ring final conductors. You're doing end to end resistance of your line and your neutral, and you're getting 0 0.18 of an ohm. You can calculate what you should be getting for the CPC. If your CPC is 0 0.30, you know that you've got the right ratio. 0 0.18 times 1.67 equals 0 0.30. If you're getting 0.78, for example, for your CPC, you know you've got a loose connection in that circuit somewhere. You've got to go around looking for that loose connection, tighten it up. You need to get it back down to about 0.30. We've got three tables here which you would use for your twin and earth. The first table, we've got the conductor size. This would be the live or the neutral, and this is the CPC. In twin and earth, the line and neutral cable is the same cross-sectional area. The CPC is different, so there's a ratio. This is a single conductor size, so 1 millimeter up to 25 millimeter, and the various milli ohms per meter. But there's also a table for your R1 and your R2 for the various different conductors and the relevant CPC in the cable. If you recall before, the 2.5 millimeter squared conductor had a milli ohms per meter rating of 7.41. We go to the same 2.5 millimeter squared conductor here. When it's combined with the 1.5 millimeter squared conductor, the CPC, we get a milli ohms per meter value of 19.51. And all I've done, if as you see here, the 2.5 and the 1.5, they added the two columns together. So to save you doing two calculations and then adding the results together. You can just combine the 2.5 and the 1.5. You'll get a milliamps per meter value of 19.51. And this is the value that you'll use when you're working out the length. We'll do an example. In this case, we've installed a socket circuit. We want to do the R1 plus R2 test. It's linked out back at the board. Don't forget, this is all dead testing, initial verification. R1 and R2 is linked out back at the consumer unit. We test at the furthest point. If the socket, you could use a socket adapter. And at the socket, you'll take your reading between the line and the CPC, and you'll record that reading as your R1 plus R2 for that circuit. And if we actually calculate that value and 2.5 line conductor and 1.5 millimeter squared CPC, 
gives it a milliliters per meter of 19.51. It's the same maths as before. The resistance of that circuit is 19.51 times 25, it's 25 meters in length, divided by 1000, and it gives us a resistance of 0.487 ohms. You can compare that 0.48 ohms to the reading you've got. So it's important that you do take a reading with your meter because you want to confirm the installed circuit and make sure it's installed correctly. The reason why it's useful to compare it to the calculated version is that you're verifying your actual test result. Say if your measured reading was 0.98 of a norm, that would equate to over 50 metres of cable. And you know that you put around about 25 metres in. So that's well out, so you need to do some further investigation. You need to see if you've got a loose connection. And at the other end, when you're doing your testing, your link out lead is not tight. So check these things out. Make sure that the connections are tight in the socket. And make sure that your meter is working as well, of course. Because if you've installed 25 metres of cable, that resistance reading has to be around about 0.48 of a norm. If you're getting double that, you know there's something wrong. You need to do some further investigation and find out why. That's why it's such a useful test. You're making sure that the circuit is installed correctly before you're liven it up. It's also useful for when you're doing your periodic inspection because you can verify your results against the length of the circuit. You won't know the amount of cable installed. You'll have a rough idea by the length of the run from where the fuse board is to where you're measuring the circuit. You'll know if you're happy with the results you're getting from your metered tests. So I'll put a table together here with the regular conductor sizes from 1mm squared to 25mm squared. And there's the milliamps per meter for each conductor. And then I've calculated the expected resistances from 5 meters up to 100 meters. And so if you've got 35 meters of 6 mil cable, you should be expecting a reading of 0.107 ohms. If you've got 50 meters of 16 mil, you'll be getting a reading of 0.057 ohms. And you can find all these values in Appendix I and the on-site guide. So we've been working out the expected resistance for a length of cable, but as mentioned before, we can work out the expected length for a non-resistance. It's just a little bit of transposition of the formula. So we're going to do the R1 plus R2 for 2.5 millimeter squared twin nerve cable. And that's 19.51 milliohms per meter for the R1 plus R2. We transpose it. So the length we're looking for now. So if we've got a resistance of 0.48 ohms, for example, what we do, we divide the 0.48 by 19.51, the milliohms per meter, and we times that by 1,000. That gives us 24.96 metres. As we can see before, it was 25 metres. We've lost a little bit in the maths. We're there and there about. That's how you calculate the length from a non-resistance, which can be really useful as well. So that was just a quick non-resistance in length. I want to do insulation resistance next, which is a great test for when you're doing your fault finding. Anyway, thanks for watching.